talk about unconventional superconductivity in topological insulators and on hexagonal lattices. Thank you so much, Francesco. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I would love to obviously thank organizers for, in, organizers for inviting me. And I will not talk about the, or at least not explicitly about the interface between the ferromagnet and superconductor. I also will not talk about diffusive regime. So, uh, <laughs> 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 what I'm going to talk about, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, I'm just only setting up the, um, uh, the background. So, I will actually talk a little bit about what happens at the interface between the superconductor and topological insulator. And in some situations, we put their magnetic field, in some situations, we don't. However, what we would really uh, like to understand is if in this kind of, so we are going back to this kind of Majorana mode, or Majorana um, topic, if in this kind of junctions, one can actually see something specific. So for the wires, as you also heard, seem to be a little bit much easier because you only have a few modes uh, which are in the problem, okay? But here in the topological insulator, especially for a surface states of 3D topological insulator, you have many modes. And these many modes actually contribute to the system and what happens is that there is no really the pure P, wa uh, pure P wave superconductivity. So one has to really deal and ask questions how to see this P wave superconductivity, how to see this Andreev, uh, topological Andreev band states. Okay? So what I'm going to focus on in this talk is actually, because I wanted also to talk about hexagonal uh, superconductivity on the hexagonal lattices, but it's too much. So at the end of the story, actually, show you a slide, what is it about, and you can ask me before, later, and so on, during, uh, after the talk, uh, and so on, okay? So, uh, I will actually, as I said, I will be interested in, in topological Andreev bound states, the, which are forming in uh, the Josephson junctions based on the topological insulators, and I will ask, so this, this property of this topological insulators, as you already he uh, heard about, this helicity, this spin momentum locking, how does this show up in this kind of hybrid topological insulator superconductor junctions. Then I would like to, so this is all nice, and you will see that you can see signature uh, in the DC current, but then the question always uh, comes up, what is the role of quasi-particle poisoning and so on and so on. So I will want to convince you that actually looking at the thermal conductance might be uh, a better way of uh, understanding topological and rave bounds. So it's related to the previous talk, but currently I'm not going to put uh, a ferromagnet. I put some magnetic field, which I think is interesting because it's orbital. So let's, uh, let me just uh, come to this. And then in the third part, actually, another way of seeing this kind of uh, non-trivial and rave bounds states through the AC Josephson effect. Okay, so just very briefly, of why I don't think I need to show it, but in general, for the topological insulators, we have a uh, bulk gap, which is in general insulator, and at the edge, we have a metallic states, which can be 2D or three-dimensional, depending on the situation. So, for example, in this uh, gallium antimonate in the marcenite quantum wells or in mercury terrorite quantum wells, what happens is that you have what is called the band inversion. So, you have a material which has the P like the uh, uh, conduction band and S like the um, conduction band. And then it is actually sandwiched with two situations where you have a usual vacuum, so more or less uh, electron like the conduction band. And then you see this kind of edge states forming. This is this kind of simple picture in which you can see these two counter propagating edge states of the 2D topological insulator. So obviously, this 2D topological insulator, you can think about it as two copies of the quantum <laughs> Hall effect. So let's say for the one magnetic field and opposite magnetic field. And if you put this together, then what happens is, is that you have a system which preserves time reversal symmetry and, for example, cannot be backscattered by the usual elastic impurity. So if I put a usual elastic impurity to the system, and I look at the property of uh, the time reversal operator, I immediately see that there is no backscattering. Okay. 
So this is exactly this, this kind of property which I'm showing here, which just comes from the anti-unitarity of the time reversal operator. And the same actually with spin helicity, the same happens actually for the surface state of 3D topological insulator. When one has now this <coughs> two-dimensional uh, gapless surface states where the spin and momentum are locked. And again, there is this lack of 180 backscattering between these two states. Yeah? So I cannot just put a simple potential and backscatter between these two states. Actually, this effect gives rise to the usual Klein tunneling in these materials. And I would like to show you that this effect also appears in the superconducting state. And you can actually think about it as the superconducting Klein tunneling. OK, so let me explain a little bit more. So if I am having topological insulator, which in general is narrow gap semiconductor, and I have a positron <laughs> and electron band, then I actually can think, I can change from the complex field in which I'm actually describing a Dirac equation to the Majorana uh, <laughs> equation where I have a real field. And then actually I have this kind of conjugated state when my particle is equal to the antiparticle. And in this situation, what happens is that in some sense, if I'm starting with the 2D topological insulators, then and if I do not break time reversal symmetry, what I expect is helical superconductor, meaning that what will happen is that I will actually have the Kramer's partners uh, helical majoranas. Okay? So meaning that actually my order parameter will preserve still, even if it's P wave, it will preserve still uh, time reversal symmetry. OK, so what are we even interested in? So the first part is exactly about this uh, helicity, which is applied now to the superconducting state. Okay? <laughs> so uh, what I am having here is a topological insulator and the surface of a topological insulator. And then I put on this the superconductor. Okay? And now the magic happens, yeah? as, as many of you know very well. So I, as you can see here in this Hamiltonian, I have uh, the, a surface state of Hamiltonian, so this kind of uh, the spin, moment, sp spin momentum locked surface state of 3D topological insulator. Then I have this induced singlet pi ring, because now this is proximity induced effect. So I have obviously tunneling of electrons from the topological insulator, actually from the superconductor to the topological insulator, and induced superconductivity within the topological insulator. And then I can also get some spectrum shift due to tunneling. So it's really proximity induced effect. So now what happens is, is that, as you can see, this is actually gapped Hamiltonian. Yeah? But what happens is, is that because the spin is not conserved in the system, okay? the spin rotational symmetry is not conserved, also I'm injecting singlets to the system because of the strong spin-orbit inter uh, interactions, which exactly break spin-rotational symmetry, I can get a mixed order parameter. So it's not only P wave, it's actually also S wave. And now the question is, if through some simple uh, testing, I can actually see some of this component of the P wave, and I can detect it and understand. Okay. So what happens if, uh, when I look actually at the, the correlation function, it has two components. It has the components, which is exactly the singlet component, this one. But then it has a second component where I, have, where I see this helicity, as you can see. The sigma dot p comes into the correlation. So it's actually showing me this spin momentum locking of, uh, of my order parameter. And this is exactly what gives the rise to what I call superconducting Klein tunneling. So in usual Klein tunneling, what happens is it's a relativistic effect that I can actually have a transmission of electron, relativistic electron with a transmission one. Okay. okay, so now what I would like to have is actually, so I don't want to call this Majorana, let's call it Andreev bound states because as you can see, so I will have so I have a Josephson junction, and I will have at the border between the superconductor and the normal material in the situation surface of 3D topological insulator, some kind of bound states. Okay. So in general, they will overlap, and the, the gap between them will be non-zero. So it will not be actually, it's, it's almost never the zero energy state. You know? And unless the system is infinite or, it's, or this Majorana would be confined by extra ferromagnet, for example. 
And then I have a guide, which is exactly at the uh, on the eye here. So this is my guide. And now I'm asking what kind of Andreev bound states I can get and how I can distinguish the ones which are related to the P wave superconductivity from the ones which are actually just a usual boring one, which can also appear in the ballistic systems. So what, uh, what we are talking here about is then is just this usual Andreev reflection when we, after many uh, changing of the Cooper pair into the electron and hole, I can get this Andreev bound state. Okay. So what happens is that indeed, because we have this kind of sigma dot p coupling, so I really have this kind of non-trivial order parameter of my system. And let's say that I actually put uh, the, I only consider the first mode. Okay. So let's say that I will actually put py equal to zero. So let's only consider the first mode. So I have this coupling in the correlation function, which is between spin and momentum. So as long as I preserve time reversal symmetry and I go to the barrier, nothing can happen to the system. Meaning that if I would love to backscatter, I would need to change the momentum to the minus p. And this is actually causes that the spin also changes to the minus p. So this is not allowed if time reversal symmetry is in the system. So what happens is that the zero mode actually, or the first mode, will uh, go through the system with the transmission equal one. And this is what we call superconducting line tunneling in the system. And there's a question. You, you, you speak about bus scattering, which is of course forbidden, but some side scattering, no? Uh, and this is major effect. So, no, so no, no, no electrons scatter back. They always scatter to some new K, which is not back. That's a very good point. So here I'm talking about the, l the first mode. So if you now go to the other mode, you can in general be scatter through the Fermi surface. So you're right. So in general, this is possible. This is exactly what makes a problem, as you will see. This is the major channel. Yeah, that's exactly. This is exactly the other channel looks like S wave. That's exactly the point of this. Yeah. So the first mode, as we just discussed, is so this is just, uh, if you want, you can look at the uh, behavior of this Andreev bound states or energy of this Andreev bound states as a function of the phase. You can also find from this the current phase relation, supercurrent phase relation. And you see that this, if you look at this first mode, so the one which is perpendicular to the barrier, what happens is, is that the two, you have one curve and second curve. And now you can see that the energies of this two are related by helicity and time reversal symmetry. So they are really, so you should really go like a four pi, yeah? But obviously if there is some, so, so this is the first mode. Now the other modes, obviously as we just discussed this, they will have a finite gap. So there is no protection against backscattering, okay? So, so the question is how in the situation where I have a, or a realistic situation of the experiment when I have lots of of these modes which are relating, related to this kind of obl oblique incidence, or if you want two pi behavior, I can distinguish from this kind of four pi one. And, um, and that's uh, where we actually look, that's why we need this barrier in the middle regime, okay? Because we know that for the usual SN junction, so usual ballistic, superconductor, normal superconductor junction, I can write the energy dispersion or energy which is dependent on the phase um, as, as follows, where D is actually transparency. So you can see if transparency is one, I exactly get the same what's, what's coming for the topological uh, uh, Josephson junction. So one needs to do something more and what one can do is actually is to put a barrier in the middle that's what we exactly did. So meaning between the two superconductors. And then one can actually distinguish, as you can see here, the supercurrent and its behavior as a function of a barrier for the SNS junction from the superconducting TI superconducting junction. Because you can see that for the second term or for the second situation, which is of interest for us, we actually get to some saturated finite value. And this finite value is exactly related to this, uh, to this superconducting Klein tunneling of the system, so meaning to this first mode which is going through. Uh, I beg your pardon to interrupt you, but I mean, this means that you are uh, 
change this uh, the fuel plant to fuel the Fermi velocity in the York department, in New York department, right? That could be one way. Yeah. And uh, if you do this, uh, this means that you are supposing to go beyond the linear regime of the dispersion of your Dirac material, right? I mean, um, oh. Otherwise, you cannot change the Fermi velocity, so. I mean, I don't necessarily need to change the firm, firm velocity. I, what I do with this, uh, with this barrier is really it's like a gate potential. Yes. So what I am removing is some of these other modes just to see the one which I want to see. That's if I could also say like this. So the one, the lowest mode, has this protection, once again. And then the other modes do not have. So I can just actually, partially at least, remove them by, rem by changing the chemical potential. I don't need to change the ve uh, Fermi velocity of my system if it would be yeah, constant. The chemical potential will change the charge at the end, so you are moving, no? Sure, but if it's... But the shoulder dispersion is only linear, it's in a very small part. This, I mean, as, as soon as you start to the fleet or to reach the gas, you are already in a linear regime, so for sure... Okay, so then you would also have some extra contribution for the Fermi, from the Fermi velocity, that's for sure. In this situation, here we consider ideal situation of the linear dispersion. Now, if you have an extra contribution warping or something else, this would change. Yeah, this is almost... Yeah, this would change. Okay, but there is also another way, which might be, um, how to say it, uh, uh, more subtle if you want, is actually looking at the non-sinusoidal current phase relation. So, I mean, so this is a supercurrent as a function of a phase for STIS and also for the superconducting TA superconducting junction and superconductor normal superconductor junction. And again, the skewness, which I guess was also mentioned uh, on Monday, actually depends on the property of uh, the barrier. So once again, with, with the barrier, actually, the skewness is much more sufficient, much uh, more visible in the situation of uh, the uh, superconducting TI, superconducting junction, than in a situation of SNS junction. We actually looked through the, on the skewness together with Catherine uh, uh, Mola, and uh, if there are some questions, I don't want to go to, to the details of this experiment now. Okay, so as we said, is or let me maybe emphasize, it's kind of difficult to say if I am just going 4 pi or 2 pi, because I could also go like this, yeah? So quasi-particle poisonic, could the poisonic, for example, could tell me that I'm not sure on which branch of the spectrum I am. But I can do more. So another step which I could do is, I could actually look at the thermal conductance as a way to detect topological and rave monsters. Then you should ask how, because we just hear that I need a ferromagnet. Okay, so that depends in which situation, okay? So what we did here is I have a difference of uh, two uh, temperatures and then uh, obviously so I have a superconductor left, right, and then again I have a topological insulator. So the situation is the same, it's just some junction, but now I wanted to see the thermal transport. So now obviously the thermal transport through the gap especially that I do not have a ferromagnet which would polarize it, so change the density of states, it's going to be equal to zero. Okay? However, I can have for a finite temperature some effects which are non-zero. And these effects are related with the fact is that I can actually have a particle which is excited above the gap and then just go through the system. So it's more or less heat current car uh, is actually in this situation current carried by the quasi-particles above the gap, and also by breaking a Cooper pair by finite temperature, which gives me information about the, about the phase of this system. And interestingly, this thermal conductance, which is just a function, usual transmission, but now integrated over energy and obviously related to the, uh, to the Fermi distribution, seems to be much more sensitive to this topological and rave bound state than the electrical situation. And why? Because now we actually probe in some sense density of states. So let me just explain you what I mean. Okay, so the left situation is actually the situation of the topological insulator and the right situation is a normal ballistic junction. Okay. So in the normal ballistic junction, maybe let me explain first what happens is that uh, maybe the figures are not uh, 
maybe it could be better, but anyway. So here, let's say, so this is just energy as a function of phase. The color code shows me the, uh, the density of states. And what I can say is actually that in a situation, or let me draw first look at this. So I have this Andreev bound state. So if I have this Andreev bound state here in the gap, what happens is that I effectively take the density of states above the gap, okay? Meaning that somehow the density of the states of above the gap is actually feeling that I took a part of this and I uh, built an Andreev bound state, okay? Now it happens for the topological insulators, and this is this left thing is here, that independent how large is the barrier, again, a barrier I'm putting in this topological, normal topological insulator regime, this doesn't change because this crossing, as we were drawing over there, is protected. So you never can remove this Andreev bound state. So what happens is that correspondingly to this, look that now actually the thermal conductance is 2 pi, not 4 pi, so you can ask me about it. But in general what happens is that you get actually exactly for the phi equal pi in the same place where there is a minimum here in the Andreev bound states, the minimum in the thermal conductance. And this is independent if I am considering one or many modes. So actually this is much more general in the situation where for the electrical transport. Now if I would take a usual Josephson junction on aluminium for a change, then depending what would be my barrier, if this would be tunneling junction or not, so if Z is larger, so there would be tunneling barrier. If Z is small, this would be a uh, transparent barrier. I can again look at this, at this uh, phase dependent uh, thermal conductance as a function of phase, and I can see there is a difference. Be why? Because for a small, uh, small barrier, I still will see here, the, so this is huge barrier, you see, this is a difference shown. I would still see this kind of uh, ballistic and driven state. However, when I increase this barrier, what will happen is that I actually kill this Andreev bound state, meaning that it's gonna move to the edge of the, of the superconducting gap, and it's actually effectively increasing the density of states over here, so it's actually giving a peak in the thermal conductance instead of minimum. And that's exactly what changes, what changes the situation. So if, for example, uh, I can modulate or change this, so this, there is, a, how to say it, a very drastic difference between what one would observe, let's say, on the aluminium Josephson junction, which would give me a, me a maximum for the phi equal pi, in comparison with the, uh, with the situation of the topological junctions. And that's what we would like to observe together with uh, Francesco Gesotto, with our chairman. So what we would like to see is actually we would like to look at this kind of squid geometry where you have two Josephson junctions connected and now I have the normal leads, okay, on the left and on the right. And what I, uh, what one can estimate immediately here is that if I am going from, from the left and I have a phonon buff, okay, and I calculate the transfers of the heat from the left to the right just as proportional to the um, thermal conductance and multiply by the difference of the temperature. So if I establish that T left, let's say temperature of the left reservoir is 500 millik and the buff is 100 millik, then I can actually measure the change on the, uh, on the right uh, contact of the order of 20, 30 millik. This is actually measurable because uh, it is possible to measure 100 micro kelvins uh, of this temperature change, at least for the, this is the limit and, and it was much smaller temperatures variation, which is showing this kind of uh, phase relation of this uh, right contact were observed for the, for example, Josephson junctions based on aluminum. Okay. And, and how do you need to, to, to change your set? Yes. Yes, I, I would need to just put here the one time aluminium and one time my surface states of no, topology. No, okay, no. One case it's minimum and other case is maximum. Yeah, but this is if you control the set. Uh, that is tunneling junction. So they actually usually with aluminium it is a tunneling junction. I see. 
So that's what I, what I would think. I would see very drastic difference between uh, aluminium yeah. and the topological uh, insulator here. Yes, and to answer your question, on the topological side, If you have both types of uh, and real states, so how will you tell? Is it trivial and, and no, no, I mean, the topology, there is no, there is no that there is trivial and topological. They are here we take every state into account. This yes. is a point. This is a point that we take all of them. But the, the, the difference is that there is, a, if in the calculation, what, what's come out from calculation, there is a small geometrical factor which is related to the strong influence of the density of states through this particular and of bound state, which gives me that even if I have a many modes and I take them all into account, you still see a difference. That's exactly the point which I'm trying to make. <laughs> Always Well, let him measure and then we will worry later, okay? I mean, you can actually, so com coming to the magnetic fields. So I believe actually that in this particular system, because there is the spin momentum locking, which I think also would be interesting to possibly look at this uh, um, superconducting diffusive equations as well, is this kind of um, spin momentum locking, yeah? So what's new here, it's actually that the spin and momentum are locked. <coughs> okay, so if I take a 2D topological insulator, so now I change the, uh, I change the system once again. So I have a, a superconductor, superconductor left, right, and then I have a TI, two-dimensional two topological insulator, and then I put actually the magnetic flux, okay, as well. So what happens is that if I put a magnetic flux, over here, then you can immediately convince yourself that if uh, my vector potential has this kind of form, then I get a different shift or different momentum uh, or vector potential will differently uh, coupled to the Cooper pair on the top and on the bottom edge of my sample. Okay? So what happens is I would have what is often called Doppler effect, that the edge states of uh, the um, top, at the top and at the bottom are shifted differently. And this is giving interesting results because what happens is that because of this effect of shifting differently condensate of the, or edge sits on the top and at the bottom, I actually can get uh, the situations that I can close the gap. And if I can close the gap, then my thermal effects come by or they come back. Okay? So, What's additionally might be interesting is, and that's what we work out with Francesco, is, is that additionally to the situation of looking at the Andreev band states in the system, might be interesting to actually look at the thermal switches. So as you can see, see here, this is energy dependent transmission. Again, as a function now of the energy through the superconducting gap and the flux which you put inside. And indeed you have this regime where nothing happens because there is no transport, at least in the low energies, there is very low transport, yeah, because there is no transport through the gap, but above, when we're starting to close this gap for one or two channels, you started actually to see the effect. So you started to see the, uh, uh, the non-zero uh, conductance or the change in the temperature of the right lead. So again, this kind of thermal switch could be quite could be quite effective actually, seem to be two times more effective than the one which is based on the usual classical superconductors. What's interesting here because of the spin momentum locking, hmm? uh, what did you say? <laughs> okay. uh, what's interesting here is, I will talk to this whole day, you know, <laughs> just joking, <Okay>. is, <laughs> uh, is as you can see here, so um, the efficiency is really defined as the minimum minus maximum temperature and, and, and so on. Okay, so I mean in the last uh, part, which I cannot talk much about because I have a one minute, uh, 
I have, uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about a C. Josephson effect. So we were talking about how to see this topological and drive bound states in the DC current. We talked uh, how you can see this in the thermal conductance. And then the last part is how to see it in the AC Josephson effect. Yeah? And then, for example, what you can do is, and what you, can, you need to really have a look at, so sorry that I have to run through this, but you need to ask yourselves in which regime you could have a strong signature of this 4 pi mode, in res even if the 2 pi mode is non zero. And that's more or less what we were very much interested in, in looking at this kind of resistive uh, model, RSJ model, with resistance and capacitance and so on, to understand when the, where, this, uh, um, where this is a C. Josephson effect should happen. Okay. So let me skip this. And then the part about the hexagonal uh, lattices, where you also could observe possibly Majorana, is actually related to one of the talks, I guess, which will be later on, which is related to the D plus ID superconductivity. So if you have a hexagonal lattice, you can have a, uh, you can have a competition between D plus ID and F uh, pairing, and then you can try to understand how to see this in the experiment, like in STM, for example, and, uh, and then uh, how to distinguish between this different pairing and how to modulate by the Zeeman and Rajba in the system e existence of the Majoranas. Okay? So let me acknowledge my collaborators, especially Stanford groups, Fior and Experiment, experimental group in Würzburg, as well as um, uh, people who were involved in the AC Josephson effect. And uh, 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 let me acknowledge my group. You saw already the pictures of them. So uh, Bjorn Sofman, Grigory Tkachev, as well as Fernando, who is over there and who was doing the last part. And let me summarize. So I was trying to tell you that although uh, in topological insulators it is not maybe so easy to see, or at least we are not so fast to immediately claim a Majorana, we actually have the ways to see this kind of Andre of topological Andre of bound states when we are now moving in direction to more or less uh, get the signature more, more, more and more pronounced, for example, in the thermal transport and in the C. Josephson effect. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>